Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, The Great Rethink, Down Under, uh, and this is all about Australia's evolving relationship, revamped relationship with China. And my guest today is Dr. Mohan Malik, the professor at the Daniel K. Noe Asia uh, Pacific Center for Security Studies. Welcome to Asian Review. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for having me on the show. I should say, welcome back. But it's been a while since you've it's been, been here, so it's, it's great to see you again. Uh, well. Australia really seems to be undergoing this soul-searching rethink about its relationship with China. It wasn't that long ago. Australia seemed to be going, as they say, hell-bent for leather for creating a closer relationship uh, with China. I remember reading things no more than five years ago, these big plans the government was having. This is how we can become more cynicized and this thing. And now there's a 180 degree, a seemingly 180 degree return going on. So what's caused this a rethink? Num a number of incidents, uh, uh, growing uh, evidence of uh, China's interference in Australia's political system. Uh, for example, a number of very prominent politicians uh, have been influenced by Chinese front organizations to support China's interests, whether it is on Taiwan or the South China Sea. Uh, you know, China, Australia is one of the few Western democracies that allows funding for its political parties by uh, you know, non-Australian foreign donors. And uh, that loophole was exploited by some very rich, wealthy Chinese connected with, with the Chinese Communist Party United mm. Front uh, Works Department to finance uh, elections uh, uh, in Australia. So Sam Dastiari was the most prominent labor politician who got caught in, in this. Andrew Robb uh, got a good you know, deal after he retired as, def as a trade minister. He was also the one who facilitated uh, the lease of Darwin Port mm. for 99 years, a commercial really? lease. Uh, and then Bob Kaw, former uh, former minister, uh, who uh, sits on the board of Australia-China Relations Institute uh, uh, in Sydney, that's funded by the Chinese, uh, you know, businessmen. So that that was one. Then uh, over China's, you know, militarization of the South China Sea uh, and uh, this. Uh, external uh, you know, tensions between Australia and China over a whole host of issues, free trade agreement, uh, um, and uh, uh, Australia's growing dependence on China. The trade volume is worth $150 billion, mm. which is enormous, which is huge. Uh, and the growing uh, role of uh, Chinese diaspora within Australia, you know, one uh, in 10 Australians speaks Chinese at home. Mandarin uh, is spoken at home uh, in, in one in 10 households in mm. Australia. Mm. So there's a large scale of, um, you know, um, demographic shift also within the Chinese community. Um, uh, in Australia, you know, up until the 90s, most uh, of the Chinese who came to Australia, migrated to Australia, they came from Taiwan, South China, Southeast Asia, um, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and uh, post uh, Tiananmen Massacre 1989. Uh, but uh, those uh, who are coming now, they are quite wealthy, rich, and very well connected with the party and the elite. Mm. Um, and Australia also depends very heavily on China for its uh, uh, higher education sector. Most universities would love to have Chinese students mm, because they're just very like America. Paid. Yes, so you know, I guess Australia makes about twenty-five billion dollars from Chinese. Uh, the largest number of uh, Chinese students studying in Australia, foreign students are from China. Um, I remember the Rio Tinto case. Could you? kind of remind um, our viewers what that was about and how that might have added to this shift in thinking? Yeah. Uh 
this was a, a Chinese Australian, uh, an Australian citizen, naturalized Australian citizen, Stern, who, who was arrested uh, f by the Chinese uh, government and put behind bars uh, for leaking some state secrets uh, uh, in terms of mining, uh, you know, deal that uh, Rio Tinto had uh, with a Chinese company. And uh, Australia tried to get that uh, citizen of Australia released, but the Chinese government uh, 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 refused to release him, and uh, I think he was re released only recently after serving his term. He's back in Australia now? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if he's back in Australia, but from what I uh, heard, uh, that uh, he's completed his term, I've already completed his term, and uh, uh, the key point is that uh, Australia failed to persuade, despite its very close economic political ties with mm. China, to have an Australian naturalized citizen uh, from China released. Uh, um, and this was a major setback uh, in terms of, you know, uh, corporate relations that uh, Australian companies have had uh, with the uh, Chinese. Also, uh, Chinese have invested heavily in Australia's mining sector, mm -hmm. especially rare earths and other, you know, minerals. Uh, uh, Australia is a major uh, exporter of commodities to China. And uh, one reason, you know, Australia has escaped uh, recession over the last uh, three decades, Australia has continued to see economic growth. That's mainly because of its close ties with China, you know. Mm. Economic uh, trade relationship has been very beneficial uh, for Australia. Australia is one of the few countries that have a huge surplus in terms of their trade balance, mm. which mm. Uh, China, not many countries have That's trade sure. balance, trade surplus with uh, China. So economically, it has been a very beneficial relationship for, the, for Australia. I remember one Australian defense minister uh, saying a few years ago that Australia's defense budget is funded by the, by the Chinese government. <laughs> what he meant was that this huge trade surplus that Australia enjoys in its trade with China, that pays for its defense expenditure. You know, it, when you were saying that, um, you know, they held a naturalized, the Chinese government held a naturalized Australian citizen who, uh, who ethically was Chinese. I think deep in the Chinese mind, this thing about passports and citizenship doesn't matter. If you're born Chinese, you are Chinese forever. Yes. And you know, I see the Chinese government now, they, they're, they have this plan, uh, I've read about it recently, where they want, you know, naturalized U.S. citizens to, that are that um, you know were born in China to really come back to the motherland to sort of renew that sense of Chineseness and kind of de-emphasize their American citizenship and get back to their cultural roots. Yeah, um, under Xi Jinping, we have seen a distinct shift in terms of mobilizing overseas Chinese diaspora to contribute to China's rise, to spread China's influence. Right. Uh, so we see a number of you know, politicians that have been identified, uh, Chinese Australians, uh, recent migrants, uh, even this is happening in Canada too, mm -hmm. uh, as a number of recent Chinese who have moved um, uh, into um, Western societies. They are contesting elections, they are very, playing a very prominent role, and they have uh, had very strong links uh, in New Zealand too, you know, the case of one member of parliament uh, that I, I want to get to that yeah I want to get to that yeah. but uh, speaking about members of parliament now this uh, person who was really promoting Chinese interests in Australia was also a member of parliament wasn't yes. he is he yeah. still in parliament yeah no he no he, he quit he, he resigned quit. yes uh, Sam Dastiari mm -hmm. um, he was a labor politician um, and uh, he quit uh, he, he took a bribe of five thousand dollars and also told uh, uh, Huang Xiaomo, that uh, uh, if he doesn't, if he uses his iPhone in a certain way, smartphone in a certain way, then uh, Intel Australian uh, intelligences won't pick up uh, their com their conversation. You know, so uh, he uh, he's in the doghouse uh, now. Mm. Um, is there a um, how should I say a plan, a strategy of Aust of uh, China to split Australia from America? Yes, I go back to Madame Fu Ying, uh, who was Deng Xiaoping's uh, interpreter, 
and um, went on to become ambassador to Australia. Then she went to UK. She was a Chinese ambassador to uh, Britain. Uh, and uh, she is vice foreign minister. She held the rank of vice foreign minister, too. Uh, uh, when she was foreign minister, she was uh, ambassador to Australia in the early 2000s. Uh, there was a big news story. This was based on a leak provided by a Chinese dissident, actually a Chinese diplomat, who defected I remember this to case. Australia. Well. Um, I think it was Chang Yung Lim, uh, and uh, he revealed that uh, uh, there are thousand, at least 1,000 uh, uh, spies in Australia working for China. So there was a big news headline in Australia, Madam Fuing and her thousand spies. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, China has been trying very hard for almost uh, two decades now to wean uh, U.S. allies like South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, mm. Philippines, right. Thailand, away from the U.S. Right. Uh, and uh, growing economic dependence on China uh, for these countries' growth and prosperity. Uh, was seen as providing enormous leverage uh, to Chinese government to put pressure on them so that they don't do anything that would undermine China's interests, whether it is over the Taiwan issue or the South China is uh, Sea issue or human rights other issues. So China has used its economic clout to pressure uh, both U.S. friends and allies, but also other countries, developing countries, to toe China's line on foreign policy issues. Mm -hmm. So this is part of that strategy. H has Australia been naive about China? Well, I wouldn't say Australia has been naive, but uh, I mean, Australia, this is a, a debate that has been going on in Australia for a long period of time, actually, for a much longer period of time than in many other countries. Mm. You know, uh, Hugh White's uh, book, who you was a former Defense uh, Department official, he, uh, used to write uh, defense white papers in the 90s uh, for the Australian government, uh, became head of um, Strategic and Defense Studies Center at Australian National University. Um, he came out with a book uh, on uh, the China choice, which said that as China's power grows and America's relative power declines, Australia is confronted with a choice. You know, Australia has historically relied on great and powerful friends to uh, defend itself. Mm -hmm. uh, before the Second World War, it was Great Britain mm -hmm. uh, that Australia relied on. Post-World War II, America became Australia's great and powerful friend. So many um, uh, you know, leaders, thought leaders, I would say, many journalists, you know, uh, academics uh, uh, started arguing that uh, since uh, uh, China is rising and uh, uh, Australia needs to make sure, unlike in the past when Australia supported the U.S. in all its conflicts, uh, Australia has always been uh, fighting alongside the U.S. forces, um, yeah. Korea, Vietnam, Iraq. Canada was not there in Iraq, but Australia was there. Right, right, right. So, um, so many uh, argued, former, you know, uh, uh, prime ministers like Malcolm Fraser, Paul Keating, uh, um, uh, former foreign minister Bob uh, Carr, uh, that uh, we cannot blindly support the U.S. in its conflicts with uh, China, whether over the South China Sea or over Taiwan, because China is now very important for Australia's own growth and prosperity. So we need to be mindful of the fact that um, as U.S. and China get caught in this great power rivalry, Australia is not, does not suffer any collateral damage from their rivalry. So Australia needs to protect its own interests. But on the other hand, if you look at, you know, the dominant mainstream view is that uh, because of it's not just about shared interests uh, with the China values also matter Australia is a Western democracy and uh, it has everything in common uh, so values quite cult close culturally very close culturally and uh, militarily also Australia cannot protect its own interests on, on, on its own because other, if Australia does not depend on the US for its security um, um, umbrella then Australians have to spend a great deal more on their defense. Australian defense expenditure has to go up to 4 to 5, even 6 percent of its GDP. Mm. If Australia were to play the role of an independent player in the region and uh, has to 
uh, you know, protect its own interests uh, uh, without counting on the U.S. But Australian and U.S. militaries are very closely uh, inter, uh, interlinked. They are, mm. uh, as you see, uh, Australia was a very important piece of this uh, pivot to Asia right. uh, policy launched by President Obama uh, and uh, Darwin played very important role uh, in terms of deployment of Marines, uh, 2000 Marines, rotation uh, of Marines in Darwin. So Australia has always played a very important role and as China uh, becomes a larger player um, and uh, much more assertive, aggressive, uh, Australia has genuine concerns. Uh, as to what impact it will have on Australia-U.S. relations. Good, good. I think this is a really good place to stop here. We talked about, you just mentioned, uh, Australia's support of the pivot, and now Australia is involved in the quad. And so when we come back after a one-minute break, yeah. we want to pick it up there. All right. You're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. Mohamed Vick of the Daniel K. Inouye uh, Asia-Pacific Center for Security Studies. We're talking about the great rethink that Australia is undergoing vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with China. So we have a lot yet to cover, and don't go away, and we'll be back in one minute. Hello, and welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. I am your villainous host, R.B. Kelly. Today we are playing two truths and a lie, and I will tell you two truths, and you will tell me which one is the lie. Truth number one, this is a real mustache. Truth number two, I want you to watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. So tune in and let me know which is the truth and which is the lie. I'm R.B. Kelly with Out of the Comfort Zone and show up next Tuesday to see my mustache live. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. Mohan Malik of the Asia uh, Pacific Center for Security Studies. Uh, we're talking about uh, the great rethink that Australia is undergoing vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with China. Really, really interesting. Um, just before the break, we, uh, our guest mentioned that Australia supported the U.S. pivot to Asia during the Obama administration. Well, as we know, that's kind of fallen by the wayside. But our new strategy is the Quad, and Australia is definitely a supporter of that. So let's pick it up from there. So this Quad group of nations uh, that includes uh, Japan, U.S., Australia, and India uh, came into being for the first time in 2007. Uh, and it was disbanded in 2008, almost after one year, when uh, Labour uh, party won the elections in Australia. It was set up under John Howard when he was Prime Minister of Australia, uh, conservative co coalition government mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Australia. So Kevin Rudd became uh, Australia's Prime Minister, and uh, he uh, is a well-known China expert, too. Uh, he uh, made it clear that he had no intent to contain China. And Quad was seen. It was proposed by Shinzo Abe when he became prime minister for a very short period of time. Uh, and uh, uh, India, Australia, Japan, and U.S. Uh, held their first meeting. Um, but uh, within 12 months, it was disbanded uh, um, by, Australia, by Australia opting out of this uh, grouping of nations uh, because it was uh, uh, something that China objected to. China saw it as contained China effort mm. led by the U.S. and Japan, so Australia opted out. Um, but recently, it has been reselected. Uh, last year, um, India was quite reluctant to sign on to this. Uh, Prime Minister Abe came into power. Prime Minister Abe had been pushing for this. Many would argue that if the Quad had not been disbanded in 2008, we may not have seen the militarization of the South China Sea. To the if extent, it had been disbanded. If it had not been. Oh, if it if, had not been if disbanded. If it had not been disbanded, um, China would not have acted that aggressively. Mm. It would have acted as a constraint on China's 
expansion, territorial expansion and assertive behavior. Because the Quad was disbanded, there was no check, there was no multilateral effort to countervail China. China had a free pass over the years, and uh, now Quad 2.0, uh, as I call it, has been resurrected, mainly because of China's aggressive push in the South China Sea, its uh, activation of territorial disputes, all the way from Japan down to South China Sea to India and Bhutan. Let, let, let me jump in here, because I think there are a couple of things we might want to clarify uh, yeah. for our listeners. Okay, now, despite, as you said, when Kevin Rudd was the prime minister of uh, China, he was maybe overly China-friendly. Yes. And uh, some people might say a panda hugger. Uh, <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't I use that go term. That far, but, yeah. <laughs> Maybe shouldn't use that term. Yeah. But um, anyway, I mean, Australia has done a 180 degree turn. I mean, now it's participating in freedom of uh, navigation operations in the South Pacific. I mean, uh, in the South China Sea, uh, it's very friendly with India. It's having, I believe, there's been a couple joint exercises yes. with India. Um, and and uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe's really exercised a lot of leadership and. Um, and, and, and we see Japanese submarines and destroyers, surface vessels in the South China Sea. So things have really changed. Yes, they have. Uh, I, I believe that uh, Quad 2.0 is, like most things these days, is also made in China. It's China's aggressive behavior vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors, mm -hmm. use of economic uh, leverage mm -hmm. to force countries, to coerce countries, to tow China's line. Mm -hmm. uh, that has boomeranged. Mm -hmm. um, up until uh, the Doklam crisis last year, India was sitting on the fence. India was quite reluctant to rejoin this squad grouping. Mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, in India and Prime Minister Abe in Japan, they have a very close relationship. So Prime Minister Abe had been, you know, uh, asking India to rejoin, restruct the Quad, mm. but India was quite reluctant. But once the 73 days military standoff uh, in Doklam started, India decided to rejoin the quadrilateral grouping of nations. We should probably interject here. The Doklam in, um, issue it involves a, a territorial issue between China and India right on the border of Bhutan. Actually, it is uh, between, not uh, between China and India, it's between India, uh, China and Bhutan. China and Bhutan. Bhutan okay. is a very tiny Himalayan kingdom okay. that has special security ties with India. India is responsible for its military security. Okay. Uh, Bhutan and uh, China do not have diplomatic ties. Uh, so it's a tiny Himalayan kingdom uh, that uh, is quite fearful. It does not even have diplomatic ties. That's the only country on China's periphery that does not have diplomatic ties, formal diplomatic ties with Beijing. And they have an unresolved territorial dispute. So uh, when the PLA marched into Doklam, uh, India, as its treaty ally, like if Australia is attacked, you know, uh, as per ANZUS treaty, U.S. is bound to come to Australia's defense. So India came to Bhutan's defense to repel uh, the PLA uh, encroachment uh, into Bhutan's territory. So that was a turning point, uh, a sharp deterioration in China-India relations, uh, like in physics. Uh, in international politics, also every, every action, action has, there is a reaction. Has a reaction. So it was the Doklam crisis that convinced India that it has to send a strong signal to China. So India decided to join, rejoin the Quad. You know, I, I just a kind of a sidestep here. You mentioned uh, Hugh White, and we Kevin Rudd's name has come up twice today. Is their thinking similar? Would you say similar? How is it similar? How is that different? Because these are two very prominent figures in uh, uh, Australians that, that, that greatly impact that country's policy towards Asia. Well, not entirely, I would say. Uh, Hugh White, uh, uh, I would say Hugh White's diagnosis of the problem is right, in the sense that uh, uh, China's power has grown and uh, uh, U.S. power is in relative decline. So the costs of U.S. intervention, military intervention, are pretty high, mm. whether in defense of its allies to protect Australia and Japan or South Korea or even Taiwan to some extent, you know, if the U.S. decides to intervene in, uh, in a conflict across the Taiwan Straits, the costs for U.S. intervention have gone up. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Hugh White is basically saying is that uh, Australia needs to weigh its options very carefully. 
and uh, it cannot blindly support the U.S. if a conflict breaks out, and U.S. needs to concede ground, shared hegemony, mm. cut a deal with China before it is too late. This sounds that's, like Chaz Freeman. Yeah. Uh, so that's his argument. But the problem is that U.S. cannot. There's nothing for U.S. to concede. Uh, I mean, so U.S. cannot let uh, the uh, Southeast Asia fall under China's uh, hegemony mm -hmm. uh, because uh, U.S. does not have any, you know, power. These countries are quite, whether it's Philippines, Vietnam, you know, Indonesia, mm -hmm. they are, uh, Hugh White's analysis tends to downplay the role of Korean nationalism, Filipino nationalism, Vietnamese nationalism, Indonesian nationalism, Indian nationalism. So Hugh White is not it, it, to the much extent weight. that they say that uh, America can just manipulate those yes. countries. Yeah, America can cut a deal with uh, China, and everything else will fall into its proper place. I, I might have been that case in... at one time, but I don't yeah. think it is today. No. So I, I would say diagnosis is right, prescription is wrong, because these countries do not want to go back to where they were vis-a-vis -vis China in pre-modern Asia as tributary states of China. There is no desire to ex replace American hegemony with Chinese hegemony in Asia. So they are engaging in very complex uh, power balancing games, forming trilats. For example, when the PLA Navy conducted a naval exercise north of Australia in the Sunda Strait, that led to the formation of Australia, India, Indonesia trilateral grouping, maritime grouping, okay. like the Quad. Okay. You know, I think we better move on here. Let's talk about China's growing role in the Southwest Pacific Islands. And here, I think we can bring in New Zealand as well. Yeah. Well, Australia and New Zealand have been the largest investors, donors uh, to small island states. <coughs> We're down me. to two minutes, unfortunately. Um, and uh, what has happened is that as uh, part of it, China's Belt and Road Initiative, China has been um, uh, offering billions of dollars of uh, loans to these countries, cheap loans, whether it's in Tonga, Tuvalu, Solomon Islands, uh, and uh, uh, you know um, uh, Vanuatu, Fiji. Uh, Fiji has pursued since the military coup, not uh, look north policy, look to China and uh, Russia and other countries. So uh, they have tried to move away from Australia, the dependence on Australia and New Zealand. But the fact of the matter is that Australia still remains a very important player. Um, and China has been eyeing some very important uh, bases in the South Pacific. Down to one minute. Um, Manus Island uh, in PNG, uh, in Fiji, Black mm -hmm. Rock uh, mm -hmm. base. Uh, there was talk of uh, China expressing uh, interest in building a naval base in Vanuatu. So that has alarmed countries like Australia, New Zealand, but and they have. Australia pulled off a, a kind of a coup with Fiji, didn't it? Yes, it did. Actually, Australia was able to preempt. China uh, vis a vis Solomon Islands, that uh, fiber optic uh, cable, mm -hmm. uh, Vanuatu, PNG, and Fiji. So Australia has scored four major victories um, over the last uh, one year or so against China, uh, where China was uh, outmaneuvered by Australian diplomats uh, and scoring those uh, victories. What do they say? Australia punches above its weight. Yes, it does. That's great. That's great. Well, um, let me see here. We are down to about our last 30 seconds here. Um, I think we covered most things. Maybe we could have gone a little bit deeper, but, uh, you know, we'll have to invite you back again. I thank want to you. thank everybody for watching today. I want to thank our guests for being here with us and sharing his insight with us. And I want to remind you to join me again next week when my guest will be uh, Scott Ellinger, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, retired United States Army. Uh, Colonel Ellinger was the defense attaché at AIT in Taiwan for a very long period of time. Even after he retired, he still lives in Taiwan. He has a great insight into the Taiwan military. So it's a show that you will not want to miss. We'll see you then.